Hello, beautiful community. Let's quickly break down a conversation that's become a bit of a sensation. A few of you have asked me to break it down. Um, I haven't even checked, to be honest, if it's available with full English translation. I'll have a look and link, link that up under this video if it's there, or at least link up an article about it. This was a conversation sort of within Russian elites that slated Putin badly and got leaked by um, folks in Ukraine and um, various Russian oppositional media distributed it too. So if the conversation is real, it's a conversation uh, between Farhad Akhmetov, who is a, a billionaire under sanctions, he's Azerbaijani, you know, working for a long time in Russia, was a Russian senator up until about 2009-2010. And the other party to the conversation is a guy called Yosef Prigozhin, um, no relation to the other Prigozhin. He is a music producer with plenty of social links to the regime, don't know what other links he has. And um, uh, his wife's famous pop star and as the conversation happens, it seems that um, Prigozhin is in Dubai and um, Akhmetov is in Azerbaijan. And they say that Putin and his elite are bastards, that um, Putin has ruined the country, that he has destroyed the country's future, um, they started this most catastrophic war. Um, there's not that much of a sense of responsibility there for the war. Um, there's no sense of look at what we are party to. It's more, you know, these idiots made these idiotic decisions. And Mr. Prigozhin in particular says now that we've started it probably might be better if we won it and Mr. Akhmetov allegedly if this is a real conversation responds by saying well I you know I follow this closely I don't see how it's going to be a win here for Russia um so th th they're not feeling terribly responsible for anything but they are condemning it and using quite derogatory language toward Putin calling him a, a sort of a, a little nobody and so on So w w w what does it even mean to break that down? Well, I mean, in terms of it, in terms of government action in response to this, uh, it's tricky. I think that the natural response of the Russian agencies would be, um, you know, let's get these people's underpants, put something in the underpants, and then they might not exist anymore. But the problem is that that would magnify the story dramatically. So there's, there's a heavy incentive for the regime to um, not be inclined to follow the natural agency response and do something, there's, but actually let it go. That there's a big incentive for the regime to let it go because it just dramatically magnifies the story because if the regime responds, they acknowledge that these conversations are real um, and it's more convenient to pretend that they're not. Um, even though Mr. Prigozhin, since the conversations happened, has come out and said that definitely wasn't me, um, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, completely a fake conversation. Um, then he's come out and said, well, uh, that, 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 that was me, but like only a bit. Uh, so he said that that was him, but then th that there were bits of the conversation that were artificially inserted. Um, so it's in the regime's interest to not partake in making this conversation look real. And of course, if they dish out punishment, then the conversation will be recognized by them implicitly as real and they don't want that. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do, if anything, and they might not do anything for this reason. Um, and then Mr. Prigozhin has got stuck between saying, it wasn't me, to 
and saying it was a bit me but like not not really me but a bit me and um that that's a precarious position of course you know the, the next stage is to try to extricate himself and his family from the country but we're gonna see what happens um but what's the what are the political lessons here really because that's what we're interested in um unsurprisingly russian elites um except for those who are quite ideologically geared are thinking what is going on and who i mean who is so out of their mind that they did this what is going on with this guy mr putin is completely out of his mind um so there are people thinking that but the problem is that they have um nowhere to go with it they don't have any political options um as far as they can see um and there is a very big compounding fact that the closer you get to putin you either get just ideological people or people who are sort of um extraordinarily gifted at sycophancy and moral infortitude and completely compartmentalized instrumentalism in the way they see the world um, and so they are especially hopeless when it comes to action unless their lives are literally at such an Im in such an imminent danger that not acting is more dangerous than acting but that's not the situation they're in and then they feel sort of assailed from the other side with sanctions and so on so they really feel they've got nowhere to go so the the psychological and sociological sort of accounts of their capacity for action must be extremely pessimistic because these are really hopeless people but at the same time i mean there is an indication that uh, a lot of people are very unhappy inevitably and this conversation i think just is a revelation of that it'll make people feel now that you don't talk politics on the phone going forward um because you see that it, it it wasn't so much the feeling that um we can talk on the phone because we'll probably not get caught about politics and criticize the regime it was it was actually the feeling that as long as it's not in public the regime wouldn't mind terribly and you see that's now something that could change um so that's basically the, the analysis i mean we, we need to basically see if that story becomes really big or not and it'll become big if the kremlin reacts to it um, and it won't become big if the kremlin just tries to bury it and um by not reacting to it therefore doesn't take a stand on whether this conversation actually is real or not in their view because if the kremlin recognizes this conversation as real and takes some action the story will blow up but i mean the takeaway is um that the elites are freaking out about what's going on but that there is very little understanding in their mind about what to do about this um and they themselves will not begin acting unless they're absolutely forced by some kind of critical danger um and so what does that mean for outsiders for the russian opposition or for us westerners well we need to do what is um in our power to politicize the situation and to sort of politicize these elite elites so some of them can begin you know untethering themselves from the regime and that's an important conversation for us if you take out the russian opposition whose job is to politicize this whole scene in fact and they should do that better 
and with more unity than they're doing that. But for us, the job is just basically to talk about how we want to see Europe and where we see Russia in that European equation, what's acceptable to us and what's not going forward. Um, and have these conversations robustly about a post-war future and about the post-Putin Russia and what we expect from it and direct some of these conversations at Russia um, so that um, they begin to, so the folks in Russia begin to understand what the, what the options are, where they stand, what, what um, um, concrete sort of possibilities are there on the horizon beyond the Putin regime's um, uh, irreversible commitment to a war against the West. Uh, at the moment, nobody can see beyond that really very well in Russia. Very few people can, except the real oppositional folks. Um, so I think that conversation is important. The second conversation is important is about the sanctions. I think the sanctions need, particularly individual sanctions, need more uh, procedural clarity and they also need more procedural clarity around an exit strategy because if the sanctions are to be effective, they can't just be a tool of um, uh, sort of you know, moral condemnation. They need to be a politicizing tool. They need to be a tool that generates conflict and division. And that means getting clearer about what it means for people, for example, to come out of the sanctions. Like, what do you need to do? If you are a, some kind of a m m mega wealthy Russian with some links to the regime, but, you know, you're nowhere near Putin's Security Council. Could you come out of the sanctions? And what does that look like? What do you need to say or do? Like, do? What you need to, do you need to invest in some kind of project to do with a post-Putin future? Like, what are our expectations here? And that's the issue that's begun to get a little bit politicized in, in an awkward way, but it's good that it's moving there. Uh, by some of the recent conflicts in the Russian opposition about what it means to, to try to get people out of sanctions. Um, and whatever you think about it in practice, the principle is right. Uh, we got to be very, very clear. This is what gets you in. And, you know, for some people, you can't come out of the sanctions if you're the, the, the very top of the regime, no matter what you do. But for plenty of other people, they've got to be ways out and you've got to be, we've got to be clear about what they are. And they've got to be things that serve our needs, which is to not have an expansive imperialist project and do whatever um, we can to bring about its cessation. Um, not on top form today. Sorry, this was really rambly, but I'm grateful to, to have been with you. And a few of you have asked about this. I, I hope this, this was a little bit, a little bit useful.